House of Ed Tech, episode number 36. Hi, this is Sharon Plant. I'm at iPlant on Twitter. You are listening to Chris Nessie at the House of Ed Tech. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie. And the House of EdTech podcast explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing tools and tips that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators like you and have them share their stories. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. And welcome back inside the House of Ed Tech. Holy cow, boy, do I have a lot to share with you in this episode. Uh, coming up, I have my Ed Tech thought. I have my Ed Tech recommendation that will be in its usual solo segment. Uh, however, here in the opening, I do have a couple of recommendations, so... Get your pens and pencils ready, because we have a lot to talk about. Of course, I also have the House of Ed Tech VIP and my featured content this episode, my conversation, the long-awaited conversation, it seems, with Laura Fleming, the makerspace extraordinaire from New Milford High School, right here in New Jersey. I also have a review of my EdCamp Philly experience, which I did today as I sit down and I record this. But again, before I get to that, I just have a uh, couple of shout outs and things to mention. Uh, first, I want to give a uh, former VIP Robert Zywicki a shout out. He is now the new superintendent of Milburn Public Schools here in New Jersey. And Robert was the VIP back in episode 28, which featured my conversation with Tom Murray. If you'd like to check that out, I will put a link in the show notes and also check your podcast feed to check out episode number 28 if you hadn't heard that episode already. Ed Camp Philly. What can I say? It was a really good day. It was a nice day of PD with people who I am now friends with and connected with, and I really enjoyed myself. Uh, I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to Stacey Lindis and AJ Bianco, who presented with me. We did a session called The Power of Podcasting for Personal and Professional Growth. You can actually check out our presentation if you'd like. You can go to tinyurl.com slash power of podcasting, and I will link to that in the show notes. We did an hour session, and the first 30 minutes was that topic where we went through and we talked about all the benefits and made recommendations about podcasts that you can use for personal growth and professional growth, as the, as the title says. And then we did 30 minutes because the audience and the participants were really into it. We had a number of people who were interested in learning more about the how-to podcast, which I was very happy to uh, peel back the curtain, as Dave Jackson from the School of Podcasting likes to do. I, I peeled back the curtain on the House of Ed Tech, and uh, this very microphone that I'm speaking into, I brought it along with me. Because um, on a separate note, I was hoping to maybe do some interviews and get some stuff recorded, but there was just so much going on that Unfortunately, I didn't get to do that, so I, I don't have any sound or any actually on-the-spot conversations to share, but I was able to talk about the microphones and the gear that I use and a little bit about my setup for people that were interested in uh, starting their own podcasts. So that was really cool, and we had a great time, and we got to connect with some people that we only have ever seen on Twitter. For example, we got to meet Eric Feldman from uh, the BFC 530 chat, so like to give a shout out and hello to Eric. It was great to meet you. Great to shake your hand. And of course, we all look forward to seeing you uh, most weekday mornings at 530. It's a lot of fun. And actually, if you haven't checked out BFC 530, it's a great way to start the day. Nice, easy, quick one topic chat for about 15 minutes on the weekday mornings. Very cool. From the sessions that I went to, I went to an awesome session on app smashing. And I'm going to tell you right now, full disclosure, the two presenters, they are going to be future guests on the House of EdTech, and you can look forward to an episode all about app smashing and some great, 
great app recommendations and how you can make some things that you wouldn't necessarily think would go together, go together. So that's going to be really exciting. And I am looking forward to sharing that conversation once I can get it recorded and uh, get those presenters here on the podcast. So that's going to be really cool. Then I did a session on stop motion animation. So I got to spend a half hour playing with Lego and that was just fun in and of itself because I'm a Lego guy from way back and this was a stop motion animation session. So I got to play with the app stop motion studio, which is really cool. You are able to, um, and, and this would also be one of those bonus, uh, house of tech recommendations. So stop motion studio, how does it work? It's really simple. You put it on your iPad, uh, either an iPad mini or, you know, a larger iPad and what it does, you can set up your scene initially with clay or whatever you want, uh, but Lego is really cool. And you start by touching the screen to take that first picture. And then you have the ability to move the things in your scene that you're setting up. And if you move them ever so slightly, when you're looking at it on the iPad screen, you see, I guess the term that the woman used was um, like like an onion layer. And that allowed you to move your pieces or your parts and see where they were and you can really develop the animation so you could it could be as choppy or as smooth and exciting as you wanted to make it so i really had a lot of fun with that and i am looking forward to um doing a lot of stop motion animation as i can play with uh, some of the old legos now so that that's going to be a whole whole new world of fun for me and the other session that i went to uh, we got to play with green screens and the green screen app that we used was called green screen from do inc that's a D O I N K do Inc. And, uh, this app is actually two ninety nine in the app store and I will link to it in the show notes and the result, the, uh, actually Stacy, AJ and myself, we came in our Ed justice league gear. And so I had my Superman shirt and my Superman cape on. Yes. I'm a grown man who has a Superman shirt with a Superman cape. You could check Twitter and you can see the pictures. Um, they're out there and in the green screen, the result of that was me being put into a scene where it looks like I'm flying over New York City. So that was kind of like a dream come true. So that was really cool. So two apps that you should check out are number one, Stop Motion Studio. If you just search for that in the app store, there is a Stop Motion Studio and Stop Motion Studio Pro. The Pro version is $4.99 and I'm not going to put it all out there. You can check out those features for yourself. And the other thing that we talked about at Ed Camp Philly in our session was we got to spread the word about the new uh, hashtag podcast PD chat. And if you haven't checked it out, that's on Sunday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. And Stacy and AJ and myself host that chat for 30 minutes, two questions, plus a little homework assignment. And we talk all about, on a weekly basis, podcasting and how to do it and how you can use it to grow professionally and personally. And there's podcast recommendations. And we talk about all things related to podcasting. So if that's something you're interested in and you're looking for a easy Twitter chat to fill your Sunday evenings, come on out on a Sunday night at 8.30 PM, again, Eastern time and check out podcast PD. I do need to take a moment to thank you for supporting my BAMI awards nomination. And I'd like to give special recognition and thanks to all the people who left me community votes on the BAMI website. So in a reading that will kind of remind me of, if you're old enough to remember Romper Room or you remember watching Romper Room, these are all the people that I see in the mirror and that I would like to thank. Thank you to Tom Murray, Billy Krakauer, and Rich Kiker, who provided me with Academy-level support as a nominated host of a education podcast. And I'd like to thank the following members of the House of EdTech community. Thank you to Derek Larson, Sandy King. Nicholas Diaz, Courtney Kofeld, Christine Schiraldi, Lisa Kephart, Danny Raskin, Christine Romano, Kathy Krasnowski, Steve Figarelli, AJ Bianco, Adam Schoenbart, Jennifer Williams, Cynthia Day, Jessica Johnson, Derek Teller, Jay Eitner, Casey Bell, Alex Rosenwald, Kate Nessie, Brent Warner, and Dan Gallagher. Thank you to all of you for supporting me in the 2015 BAMI Awards, and I look forward to hopefully being announced as an education voice recipient, and I will know that information coming up a little bit later this year 
hopefully the end of June. Hopefully I can be recognized for the good things that I'm doing and that everybody has uh, been able to provide nice things to say about it. I appreciate the kind words and the reviews. So keep them coming in iTunes. That'll obviously help the show. And I will remind you about that later in the episode. But enough about that. I'd like to now share with you my conversation with makerspace guru, Laura Fleming. I'd like to welcome in Laura Fleming. Laura has been an educator in the state of New Jersey for 17 years. She has previous experience as a classroom teacher and media specialist in grades K to eight. She is currently, as you may know her, the library media specialist at New Milford High School in New Jersey, where her library makerspace has garnered national attention and has served as an inspiration for schools across the country, and I'm sure as we'll find out probably worldwide. Laura's goal is to create a learning experience that empowers and equips students with the necessary skills to effectively produce and consume content across a multitude of platforms. She is an educational consultant, thought leader, and speaker on education, and she's also an author. Go figure, a librarian who can write a book. This is fantastic. Laura is the author of Worlds of Learning, Best Practices for Establishing a Makerspace for Your School, which is part of the Corwin series, which comes out here in 2015. I've said too much. Let's say hello to you, Laura Fleming. Welcome to the House of EdTech. Hi, Chris. I'm happy to finally be here. Um, Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here tonight to talk to you about maker spaces and this whole maker movement, digital badges, as well as my work in virtual learning spaces. Just on those two topics alone of maker spaces and digital badges, we could do a podcast about that and just talk forever about it. Yes, we absolutely could. They're two of my favorite topics, that's for sure. So real quick, let me hit you with a a high heat fastball here. (laughs) You started out as a classroom teacher. What did you teach before you got into librarianship? Yeah, I started out in the classroom. I was a fourth grade classroom teacher right out of college, did that for a few years, moved up to sixth grade for a few years, and then I moved over to a library position in a middle school. After that, I was the librarian in an elementary school, and now I'm the librarian at a high school. So I've had the opportunity to teach K through 12. And what attracted you to, I guess, make the move to, because I think that's a pretty big shift, not a, not drastic and negative, but to go from classroom to librarian, which is a completely different animal. Yeah, absolutely. And it was something I have to say that I didn't plan for. Um, at the time, my school was undergoing a renovation in their library, and they did not have a librarian for the position. Um, And they really wanted to go pretty high tech with the space. So in their eyes, they wanted someone who had that ed tech background. And they felt like that person could then build up the library piece as they went along, um, kind of. Uh, So they actually emergency certified me as a school librarian um, because I had a master's degree in educational technology. So I moved into that space. And on the job in my first year, I also went to library school to get my certification. That would definitely keep you busy. Yeah, it sure did. Because <laughs> you also have a family and, you know, life is life. Life is life. That's right. I'm always busy. That's for sure. So with education technology, obviously, I think we are from a similar mold, which means we're bit by that ed tech bug. What is most appealing about technology and education for you? I think especially in my in my current position, um, I've thought an awful lot about its role Um, in my learning space. And right now I'm in a library that was built in the 1920s. And really, I've turned to ed tech as a way to go beyond the four walls of my learning space um, and bring my students out into the wider global community. And one of the ways you do that with your students is through the idea of the maker space. Expand on that a little bit. Yeah, last year I was recruited by my principal at the time, Eric Scheninger, um, to be the library media specialist at New Milford High School, which is where I am right now. Um, he once described his library there as a barren wasteland. Um, so my challenge was to transform it into a vibrant learning environment, um, one that we felt our students needed, deserved, and would value. 
along with that, I really had the belief and has always, have always had the belief that every child has the right to invent, tinker, create, innovate, make, and do. And that's really what drove my mission to establish a maker space at New Milford High School. So thanks to that, in a very, very short amount of time, we no longer had that barren wasteland. So in, again, Eric's words, um, he, he then described it as a thriving learning metropolis um, where our students flock to do all of the things that we wanted them to be doing. I, I have seen, not in person, but I've seen pictures of your library, you know, through the news and through different articles, also being from New Jersey. So I consider it to be local. It's almost like it would be like the, uh, remember in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory when he opens the door and they go into the, 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 the candy room and it's like everything is edible and touchable and vibrant and colorful and so full of life. I imagine that's what you bring to the makerspace world. Yeah, that's a really good analogy. And really that drives my philosophy and has always driven my philosophy behind all of my libraries is that, you know, my goal is to make the learning environment as participatory as possible. I always want students to have opportunities to interact with the space, always have things for them to, to do while they're in that space. Um, so really, that's what I hope my, my students feel every time they walk into our library. Exactly that. What are some suggestions or recommendations for a librarian who's listening or even a classroom teacher who's interested in diving into the makerspace concept and how they can start that? Yeah, I really think that a huge part of the success of our makerspace was the planning I put into this space. You know, every day I have phone calls or Google Hangouts or Skype calls or whatever it might be with librarians and educators all around the country who are interested in establishing a maker space, but oftentimes start at the wrong place. Oftentimes they'll say things to me like, oh, I just received a thousand dollar donation to my library and I want to start a maker space. What do I buy? So that tends to be the number one question and the number one starting point for people is what do I buy? And I really try to emphasize that it is more about or less about just buying a bunch of stuff like Legos and sticking it in a corner of your space and calling it a maker space. So what we did to plan our space was I really took the time to talk to my, my students at the school to find out what kinds of things they were interested in doing. Um, I took time to assess our existing curricula, our existing programs and offerings within our school community. I took into co consideration global trends and best practices. And based on those findings, I developed themes for our space. And based on those themes, I then ordered the stuff to support those themes, the equipment and the supplies. So I really think that the key to developing a successful makerspace really, really lies in that planning phase. Planning is key. I mean, whether you're in the classroom planning a lesson or, or, or putting together something of this scale. Now, when you talk to students, what were some of the things that students said to you when you asked them about makerspaces? Well, I didn't use the word necessarily makerspace with them at the time I was having those conversations. Um, but I did ask them about their interests. I, you know, we're a bring your own device school. There were times I even, you know, was peering over their shoulders to see what they were doing during their free time when they'd come into the library. And more often than not, I saw kids playing games. I saw them interacting with media and content. Um, and I took those really as signals, um, you know, for me as to choosing these themes and developing developing these themes around some of those things and embracing some of those concepts. I, I've only played in this space. I've never, you know, planned one or, you know, really thought about some of those things you mentioned in terms of plan. I guess it's things that I take for granted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, something I love about our space too, speaking of the kids, is that it attracts both girls and boys. Um, a lot of the times I think people think that these spaces are very boy heavy, but it really does attract both. What has now been the feedback from these same kids? Now, now it's a year later, two years later, and it's, a, it's now part of the culture and the mindset in your school. Yeah, exactly. And that's really what it's about is, is less about creating this corner that you can call a maker space, but about creating this culture that becomes pervasive in your school community. Um, so really, it's been quite a journey for not only my students, but for myself and for other teachers as well. We've really all learned together. And that's something that I emphasize with people who, who ask me for advice in, in developing these spaces as well, is don't be afraid to include concepts or themes or materials or supplies or equipment 
that that are outside of your own comfort zone. You don't necessarily have to be an expert in all of these areas um, because it really is an opportunity and has been an opportunity for my students to take control and to feel feel empowered enough to to embrace some of these things on their own and come back and not only teach their peers these concepts, but also teach their teachers these concepts. So really, we've been learning right alongside the kids, and it's been an amazing journey for us all. Now, since you just mentioned teachers, obviously the kids are a thousand percent welcome in the space and have the opportunity. Do you find that teachers come in and tinker and kind of mess around on their free time as well? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, when we first set up our space, I'll never forget the day when all of our custodians were sitting around one of our makerspace stations having a great time um, doing some of these hands-on activities. So yeah, absolutely. Um, teachers seem to be equally as interested in the space. And you know, for those that don't necessarily have time in their schedule themselves to visit this space, they've learned a lot about the work that we've done in that space and have begun to rethink their own classroom environments and how they can take some of these concepts to help them create unique learning spaces that provide opportunities for making and creating within their classrooms. And speaking of what's being created, whether it's in the classroom now or directly in your space, what's the coolest thing or the most interesting thing you've seen students create or do in the space? Hmm. I think that I provide a lot of opportunities that are open-ended for students to really develop a foundation of skills in our space, but then take off and you know go running on their own. Um, and I've seen that time and time again with so many things that we've done. But I think one of the most amazing things that I've seen was um, in regards to a station in our makerspace that I call our Take Apart Technology Station. I had this station in our makerspace strictly for students to take apart technology, hence the name. Um, and in taking apart computers, my goal was for them to learn about the different components of a computer and how they work together. Our students became so proficient at this because they were so interested in this station that not only did they take apart this technology, they began putting it back together. They understood how the components fit together and they started taking apart computers and then rebuilding them so that they worked again. So that was something that was just amazing for me because that really wasn't even a goal of mine in developing the station for the makerspace. That was all because of the children and the work that they had done taking apart technology. For them, it was a natural progression to now start rebuilding it. And based on the rebuilding of the technology, they became so good at that and, and they became so resourceful. They used things like you know hot glue guns to, to put the components back together cardboard boxes as computer cases, things like that. And they became so proficient at doing that. We eventually bought um, real kits so they could build their own real computers. Um, so what we've started doing is having them build workstations that we have throughout our school now. So that was really exciting because that was something I had not anticipated at all. Without knowing the other themes or what else your space provides, that already sounds like it would be my favorite space as I <laughs> stare at the floor here in, in in the house of ed tech literally and i see two laptops that are in pieces because i've had to frankenstein a couple other machines together yeah i mean that's their favorite thing to do i think that is definitely our most popular station in our maker space um and not only for students to just tinker and explore but students have developed real skills in that space, and several of them have gone on to either jobs within those areas or have chosen their majors or professions based on the things that they've done in that space. And eventually they'll grow up and they'll, you know, God willing, they'll become homeowners and they'll have garages and, you know, they'll have to fix their houses. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we, we absolutely do teach them real skills that, you know, unfortunately they don't receive, um, you know, in their education anymore. You know, I've taught kids how to sew. I've taught kids how to use tools. And these are high schoolers. And it was really even surprising to me how little they knew about those practical skills so I definitely feel a sense of pride knowing that when they do leave our school, they will leave with some of those practical skills that they've gained in our space. And even if it's not always the skills, 
the makerspace provides them the confidence to maybe go to YouTube, find a video, you know, like, like for me, I am by no means an electrician or a plumber, but I, I, can, I know how to go seek out the information. And I think that's just as powerful as being able to do the skill as so much as go and be able to find out how to do something and have that inquiry skill. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, makerspaces really encourage a growth mindset. You know, they encourage students to take risks. They tell them it's okay to even fail. And sometimes failing is the greatest thing that can happen to you because it's an opportunity to be more innovative. Um, And a lot of them have begun to feel comfortable in that type of situation because that goes outside of the normal traditional classroom mindset. Um, You don't get many opportunities where failure is encouraged or even welcomed. Now, I also think it's a great way to transition because of what you just described as the ideas and the mindset and the culture of a makerspace. I think you've also brought that. Well, I don't think I know you've brought that mindset into the professional learning for teachers. Uh, Yes. So that's my way of segueing into what you do with digital badges. No, it's very true. There definitely are parallels between the two. And I'm glad you recognize that because that whole informal learning piece is what really drives my makerspace as well as my professional learning platform. Can you talk a little bit about what a digital badge is and a little bit about your platform that you've developed? Last year when I started at New Milford High School, again, my principal at the time, Eric Scheninger, challenged me to develop some sort of system to train our teachers on Web 2.0 tools. He didn't really, you know, mind how I did that. He just knew that our school needed some kind of system for that to be done. So I tossed around lots of different models at the time. I didn't really feel comfortable with any of them. I knew that I had to flip our professional learning for it to be successful. I knew that I wouldn't see all of our teachers in, you know, one room at one time very often throughout the school year. So I knew that I had to go to the digital space. Um, I just wasn't sure exactly how I wanted to do that. Um, At the time, I was also researching the concept of digital badging. And I really wanted to develop some sort of digital badging platform for our students. Um, I was thinking in regards to digital citizenship or something along those lines choosing skills that, you know, students aren't traditionally assessed on. I felt that digital citizenship piece was a really important one. However, I really felt like that digital badging initiative would fall flat if my teachers didn't have exposure to digital badging themselves, because none of them had at that point any experience with digital badging. So it was at that time I decided to merge the idea of digital badges with professional learning and created as a result this informal professional learning platform. Um, it's called Worlds of Learning at New Milford High School, and it's it can be found at worlds-of-learning- hyphen lots of hyphens in there, nmhs.com. And really the idea is that um, it's a place where teachers can learn, experiment, grow, and be challenged, and kind of feel safe because it is an informal learning platform. It was really designed for people who take control of their own professional learning and learn outside the hours of the normal school day and can get credit for doing so. Um, Teachers can pick and choose what they want to learn and really chart the course for their own professional learning. Their skill mastery is acknowledged with a digital badging system. So they're recognized for skills that they acquire throughout the school year by completing tasks outlined on the platform. Now, in the platform, what is some of the more popular content that you see teachers wanting to learn about? All of the badges we have available are are pretty much equally as possible. But the one that I've gotten a lot of feedback on especially is Twitter, because a lot of um, educators, especially educators that I deal with, are connected educators and oftentimes struggle to find a way to showcase that professional learning that takes place on Twitter So a lot of teachers have enjoyed earning our Twitter badge um, as a way to showcase what they do with that platform. Now, outside of the platform, since since you you mentioned Twitter, so I'm going to go there. When anybody comes up to you or or, or meets you and they say, hey, Laura, what's, what's this Twitter thing all about? What are some of your hot, easy points that you go to to say, here's why you should be doing it? Yeah, and I think especially I talk a lot to library media specialists because I am one. 
Um, and something I tell them all the time, and this is really what Twitter did for me and has done for me over the years, is sometimes when you're a librarian, sometimes you're the only one in your school district. More often than not, you're at least the only one in your building. Um, so it's a way to kind of break down the walls and and connect with other people who are doing exactly what you're doing. And, you know, Twitter has really provided opportunities to both share your work with other people and also learn from their work as well. Now, what do you tell the teachers or your colleagues or librarians that you meet that say, I don't have time for this? Yeah, um, you know, I, I explain to them. Um, that it really is about, you know, what you choose to put into it is what you will get out of it. And that because Twitter is set up the way it's set up, it isn't, it's meant to be not that time consuming, you know, things can be read in small chunks. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you don't learn a great deal, you certainly can, it just doesn't have to be super time consuming. I also recommend um, to them to follow the TL chat hashtag, which is really the go-to hashtag for school librarians. So it kind of takes all the information that's out there on Twitter and curates it into one place um, where where they can go. Is TL chat your favorite chat and chat of choice? It's definitely my favorite school librarian chat for sure. Um, you know, it depends on what what kinds of things I'm interested in learning and sharing. You know, I I, I also love Badge Chat K twelve Ed Tech Chat. Um, they're all great chats. Um, you know, but for my library work, yes, I I tend to go and and for my makerspace work as well, I tend to go to TL Chat. And still staying with digital badges, what do you think the future of digital badging is for professional development? What do you think the rest of 2015 and beyond holds for that? Well, you know, I think that professional learning was broken, is broken, and I think that has provided us with an opportunity to rethink the system and how it's done, um, you know, not only at a district level, but even beyond that, at a state level, a national level, whatever it might be. Um, I think that, you know, for any sustained professional learning initiative to really work, to really flourish, um, it has to ensure that teachers have choice that's built in and that they feel empowered and trusted and that they don't get credit for seat time, but rather through some sort of outcome or evidence-based system such as ours with digital badges. Tom Murray really summed it up best when I had spoken with him, and he, he was referring to students, but I also liken it to adults as well. If we're measuring seat time, we're measuring the wrong end. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to say that our digital badging platform is actually featured in Tom's new book on professional learning. Well, that's good to know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which which book is that? Because I know, I mean, his name's on a bunch. Yeah, the one that he just published through Corwin Press in the Connected Educator series. The same series that my Makerspace book is in. You're jumping the gun, Ms. Fleming. Yeah. <laughs> We, we will get to your book, I promise. Was that like the grand finale? <laughs> I, I usually hold books till the end. <laughs> Very and <funny>. we will. <laughs> um, but let's go back inside your library for a second. Yes. Um, a, another part of my notes is I have cloud-based teaching and learning in the modern library. Now, your library isn't all makerspace. There's books. And you use a lot of Web 2.0 tools. What are some of the things you do for, you know, promoting research and I guess the hardcore libra library skills that the media center would provide for kids? What are some ways and tools that you're doing? Wait, that question sounds really awful. <laughs> <laughs> but you know where I'm going. I just got to get it to sound right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I, I absolutely am so lucky that I don't have a structured schedule. Um, so that frees me up and allows me to either collaborate with classrooms and classroom teachers either in the library or in a computer lab or in their classrooms even. Um, so, you know, part of, of what I am at New Milford High School to do is, is to do that exactly. Um, so I'm oftentimes collaborating with classroom teachers on their authentic content. You know, I believe that those skills, those library, quote unquote, library skills should not be taught in isolation. They should be taught as authentically as possible. 
Um, so I oftentimes piggyback on their research assignments or, you know, whatever projects they're working on at the time and come in and, and talk directly to the students and work directly with the students on those concepts. Um, now, speaking of worlds, you have worlds of learning, worlds of making, and now worlds of learning is a book, the best practices for establishing a makerspace for your school. So now, Ms. Fleming, tell us about your awesome new book. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really excited about this book because, you know, especially when I was hired by by Eric last year, I really thought long and hard about how to brand myself and brand the work that I hope to be doing. Um, and, you know, that all started with my my blog, which is worldsoflearning.com. And then once I started to get into this makerspace work, I developed a website called Worlds of Making. Um, and my badge site is worlds of learning at nmhs.com. So there's a little theme going on there. Um, so it really, really was special to me to see um, this book grow out of all of that as like the next step. Um, so seeing worlds of making in print now is super, super exciting for me. Um, and I'm really proud of this book um, and happy to see the response it's been getting so far. Um, really, the goal of the Connected Educators series is that these books are short enough where educators can read these books in one or two days and, you know, the next day or the following Monday, whatever it might be, implement these best practices into what it is they're doing. So they're written very practically, and I've gotten great feedback on this Makerspace book, and it seems to be influencing people as they think about developing their own spaces, which is what I hoped for. Now, I do need to ask you a question about writing a book. Yeah. So, <laughs> obviously, at some point, you know, Corwin approaches you and says, hey, Laura, you know, we'd like to, you know, get you involved with the Connected Educator Series. I'm sure there's a, a nice piece of excitement like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Yes, definitely. Without Did, a doubt. Was there ever a point where you were like, okay, cool. And then you're like, wait, I have to write a book. Yes. And like, what was that? Is that, is that a daunting task? I mean, the longest thing I've ever written is my master's thesis. Um, so what are your thoughts on how to approach writing a book? Yeah, I definitely wish that I had paid a lot more attention to writing as, as a student when I was in school, because, you know, I always liked to write, um, but I definitely um, didn't graduate high school or college with an exceptional foundation in writing. And it's really been a journey for me. Um, thinking back to my early days of blogging and what my blog posts once looked like and what they look like now, I've definitely grown as a writer. Um, and really, you know, you hear this all the time and I can't emphasize it enough. The way to become a better writer is to write yourself and write often um, and, and not be afraid of what thoughts you're going to put down on that paper and being afraid of being, you know, right or wrong, just getting your thoughts down on that paper and shaping them as you go along. Um, so yeah, I definitely had that moment where I thought, oh, this is going to be fantastic. Oh, wait, <laughs> I'm not sure that I can do this. Um, but I really have grown a lot over the years, um, as far as my writing is concerned. So it was definitely less daunting of a task than I thought it was going to be. I, I definitely agree. And and to your point about, you know, if you want to be a better writer, write more. I also think it helps when you realize, okay, I'm writing, say, blog posts, and maybe somebody's reading what I write too. I write a blog and thousands of people I know definitely are coming to look at this. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I began to also feel a little bit empowered um, over the years because people are paying attention. And I'm realizing that the work that I'm doing is helping people. Um, so, you know, based on that, I find it a lot easier to write. I think about the people on the other end who I'm trying to help and the kids that their work is affecting. And that's something I can relate to here, even just, you know, doing the podcast. I'm not big into writing blog posts, but when I create these episodes, I try and make sure, you know, the guests I'm able to acquire and, you know, the tools and things that I recommend, you know, that everybody can come away from an episode with something they can, as I say, you know, hear about today and use tomorrow or even later that same day, depending on when you listen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's all about making education better and continuing to push these concepts forward. Laura, you've shared a plethora of information 
And because you're a librarian, I'm trying to impress you with larger vocabulary because librarians like big words. So based on all the information you've shared, people are still going to have questions and want to learn more about what you do and how you can help them. What are some ways that people can get in touch with you that you wouldn't consider stalking and it's okay if they do? <laughs> well, I get people calling me all the time at school, so that's always great. But I'm definitely active on Twitter, so I would say that's definitely a good starting point. My Twitter handle is at NMHS underscore LMS. Um, and, and my blog has all of my contact information on it as well. My email address, my Twitter handle, um, all of my social media pages and things like that. Well, Laura, thank you for stopping here on the house of ed tech and, uh, you are welcome anytime. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. It was a blast. Thanks again, Laura. It was great to have you on the podcast. I'm glad you listened to the show. That is uh, very exciting to know that you appreciate what I'm doing and you find value here in the house of ed tech. And now let's move over and let me share with you this episode's ed tech thought. This episode's ed tech thought I'm calling smarter ways to use Google classroom. And this actually comes from an article I read on teachthought.com, which talked about 60 Count them 60 smarter ways to use Google Classroom. A couple of highlights that I want to share with you. Number one, have students chart their own growth over time using a tool like Google Sheets, which you can then obviously use in Google Classroom. Number two, as a suggested way to use Google Classroom, you can create a test that grades itself using Google Forms. And a great add-on that I love to recommend to you is Flubaru. That's F-L-U-B-A-R. Oh, oh, Flubaru. The next one, you can encourage did, did, eh. <laughs> you can encourage digital citizenship via peer-to-peer -peer interaction that is documented. You can also encourage students to use their smartphones for formal learning by accessing documents, YouTube channels, group communication, digital portfolio pieces, and more on a BYOD device. Students will have the chance to see their phone as something other than a purely for entertainment device. And the last one that I like to recommend and well really highlight off this main list of 60 things, since access is tracked, you can look for patterns in student habits. Those that access assignments immediately, those that consistently return to work, and so on, and you can communicate those trends anonymously to students as a way of communicating quote unquote best practices in learning. And that's for students who may not think otherwise. Check out the full list of 60 by clicking the link in the show notes and let me know how you're using Google Classroom by sending me some feedback and I will let you know how you can send me feedback at the end of the episode. And now my official EdTech recommendation for this episode. I'd like to recommend an awesome Chrome extension called DraftBack. That's D-R-A-F-T-B-A-C-K. And this is a Chrome extension for Google Docs that I learned about at Ednato back in April 2015. DraftBack lets you play back the revision history of any Google Doc that you can edit. It's like going back in time to look over your own shoulder as you write. With DraftBack, your data is kept entirely private. DraftBack was purposely designed so that you could play back your own docs without having to share them with a third party. This is your data. DraftBack does, just lets you see it in a new way. DraftBack only needs access to docs.google.com to get the revision data for playback, but that data never leaves your own browser. And here's something new about DraftBack. It's now possible to extract any part of a doc's playback and embed it on the web. This, of course, makes the extract accessible to the public, but it basically turns your revisions into a movie and you can go back rather than go back and have to kind of click through the revision history. This will make a nice little video and you can watch it happen. And it actually also works with people that you are sharing a document with. You can go back and you can draft back the whole history of the document and watch it as a video. So that's pretty cool. And there will be a link to the Chrome App Store to check out DraftBack. 
And that's my EdTech recommendation. And of course, no episode is complete, as I've said many times before, without the House of EdTech VIP. Congratulations to this episode's VIP, Mr. Adam Schoenbart. Adam is from the hashtag EdJusticeLeague. Congratulations to Arrow himself. I was able to really meet and connect with Adam back in uh, April at EdNATO, and I'd like to recognize Adam here. Adam is an English teacher in a one-to-one Chromebook classroom. He's a Google EDU trainer and educator. He is now a conference presenter. He's an avid comic book reader and comic book fan, and he's an ultimate Frisbee player. He has awesomely co-created the hashtag EdTechCalNYNJ calendar, and you can find that at tinyurl.com slash EdTechCalNYNJ. And that calendar is a great resource for adding your New York, New Jersey conference and event information that people might be interested in. You just throw the event on the calendar and it's now shared with a much greater audience. So a personal thank you to Adam and actually Danny Raskin for creating this calendar and putting it out there. I'd also like to share with you a little bit more about Adam. And this is an excerpt from The Current. And The Current is the Ossining High School student newspaper. And this article was written by... Evan Seligman. I think I said that right. Quote, and this is from the article. As a teacher, his, and this is referring to Mr. Schoenbart, his lessons are thoughtful, interesting, and unique. Even when he's not teaching his self-designed myth, magic, and make-believe class, in which he teaches his students about different mythologies, archetypes, and classic story elements, he still manages to channel some of his inherent geekiness into his 10th grade English class work. This might mean showing the film X-Men First Class to draw the parallels of the outcasted mutant superheroes in the film to the civil right issues and themes present in Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. He is the only teacher in Ossining High School to assign comic books to his students for required reading. Very cool. He works hard to keep his students engaged and goes out of his way to ensure that everybody gets the help and attention that they require in order to succeed. And I will link to this full article in the show notes. Congratulations, Adam. You are the House of EdTech VIP, and everybody needs to connect with Adam. He's on Twitter, Mr. Schoenbart, that's M-R-S-C-H-O-E-N-B-A-R-T, and he has a brand new blog that you need to go and check out, and it's called The Schoen Blog, and that's at schoenblog.blogspot.com, and I will link to that, of course, in the show notes. And congratulations once again, Adam. Congratulations to the arrow. You are the House of Ed Tech VIP. And that is going to do it for this episode of the House of Ed Tech, sponsored once again by todaysmeet.com. Check out todaysmeet.com slash houseofedtech to learn more about how you can add back-channeling to your classroom today. And of course, keep the conversation going and visit my website, chrisnessy.com. That's N-E-S-I dot com. Over on the website, you can review the show notes for this episode, number 36, and I would love your thoughts on the information and resources that I shared in this episode. You can leave a comment on the show notes, or you can email me, and the email is feedback at chrisnessy.com. And you can also submit audio feedback. You can call the House of Ed Tech feedback line at 732-903-4869. And you can connect with me on Voxer. My username is cnessy4602. And of course, make sure you connect with me on Twitter. My username is Mr. Nessie, M-R-N-E-S-I. And just use the hashtag House of Ed Tech in your tweets so I can see them and know that you're talking about the podcast. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, and honestly, I really don't know how you don't. I mean, you're here, you're listening to it, you must like it. Consider rating and reviewing the podcast on iTunes. A five-star rating in your positive review will help to keep the House of Ed Tech front and center 
for other educators to discover and enjoy. You can also support the show through patreon.com, and you can check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of ed tech. And uh, on the next episode of the podcast, I will be speaking with the awesome and my pals, Stacy Lindis, once again, and we'll be welcoming in AJ Bianco for the first time. And we're going to be talking podcast PD. Now, due to the Memorial Day holiday and some other things I have going on, episode 37 will be released a week later, and that's going to be on June 7th, 2015. So make sure you come on back for episode 37. And once again, of course, thank you for listening. I do appreciate it, and I'm glad you stopped by every time you do. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.